Tonight we're continuing with our, uh, our series, No Names in the Bible. This is number two. I don't have a, really a, a title to this sermon. I'll probably come up with one to put it on YouTube. But we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 10. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 10. This week's no name is the Queen of Sheba. You know, it never does give us her name. It just says, you know, she's the Queen of Sheba. It's a really good story here. <clears throat> and we're going to be in verses 1 through 13. And if you guys are there, in verse number 1 it says, And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land, of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold, and of spices very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees and precious stones. And the king made of the almug tree pillars for the house of the Lord, and for the king's house harps, also in psalteries for singers. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us together today. Thank you for such a wonderful day you've blessed us with. Thank you for every day that you bless us with. Uh, we ask that you be with each and every one of us tonight. We pray that we're able to uh, look into your word for guidance into our life and for edification. Uh, we pray that you soften our hearts and open our minds to take in your word and share it with the world. I pray that you be with me. Uh, and guide me through your word to, to help preach it and teach it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, as, as studying this out this past week, there is so many verses uh, that there's no way that I could, uh, you know, put them all down to explain everything that's going on uh, in this little passage of Scripture. Uh, most of the stories in the Old Testament are a picture of Christ, uh, you know, or the church, or the kingdom of God, uh, all his blessings, all his judgments, you know, but most of the stories that God gives us, even in the Old Testament, are all about Jesus uh, and, you know, his coming and what he's going to do and uh, how he leads his people in the Old Testament up into the New Testament, you know, where God spoke to us by Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is no different here. Uh, in this little passage of the Queen of Sheba. 
It never gives us a, a name. And I, I think the reason why, you know, God never puts a name uh, to a lot of these stories is because it's for our edification. It's not necessarily for, for them that happened back there because uh, a lot of those uh, people did have names. You know, like when we get into the book of Acts, the Ethiopian eunuch, he came uh, from the, uh, the, the queen of Ethiopia. Her name was Candace. He gave her her name, but that was in the New Testament. That applied to us because we're a New Testament church. Same thing back here. There's no need to give a name because this applies to us also. And I think that's why there's so many stories in the Bible with people with no names. Because they don't need a name, it, it applies to everybody. And it's the situation that he's trying to explain, not the people. And this is a picture of the bride of Christ. As we read through this and as I studied it, you know, I realized that, you know, this is a perfect picture of the bride of Christ. Uh, it talks about the house he built over there in, I think, verse number four. But Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. Uh, you know, it's, it's Jesus that built the house, but this shows, you know, him building the house and how he went up into the house of God. And we'll get into that later. But in Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You know, this talks about the house of God. And the house of God, you know, is like a bride adorned for her husband. And verse 9, it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. You know, that's the city of Jerusalem coming down, and uh, John is saying that, you know, that's uh, the bride of Christ. You know, which we are the bride of Christ, and that's the mansions that he has built for us. And that's what he's talking about here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10, as he went up into uh, the house that he had built. Jesus built the house. It says in chapter 4, verse 34 of 1 Kings, They came to hear his wisdom. But here in chapter 10, it says, But she came for something special. Because it says in verse number 1, And when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, you know, back there in chapter 4, it says that all men came unto Solomon for to hear his wisdom. But the queen of the south, or the, the queen of Sheba here says, she came concerning the name of the Lord. Uh, it also says that she came to prove him. She came to prove him with hard questions. Uh, she heard of a man of God, just like all the other kings and all the other men of the nations that it says in chapter 4 came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, she heard of a man of God. Jesus said, seek and ye shall find. And that's exactly what she's doing here. She's coming to prove him with hard questions. Uh, she's coming to the man of God. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says, And ye shall seek me. And find me. When ye shall search for me with all your heart. Uh, I, I skipped over 1 Kings 4.34. Let me go back and, and read that real quick. Uh, just to clarify what I was talking about. It says, And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon. From all kings of the earth which heard his wisdom. Which had heard his wisdom. You know, so it was saying that all men came unto Solomon to hear his wisdom, but she came for something special because it was concerning the name of the Lord. And then in Jeremiah 29, he's saying, You shall find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. She's coming to a man of God. And if we get over into uh, verse number 2, it says that she communed with him with all her heart. See, she's seeking uh, for God. And she's going to Solomon because she heard of his fame Concerning the name of the Lord, she communed of all that was in her heart. She's seeking God because she heard of a man of God. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 7, 
It says, And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. See, everybody that knows in their heart that there is a God will seek after God. And where do we do that today? You know, we go to the house of God. We go to church, uh, hopefully to a Bible-believing church. But that's where we go to seek God today, and that's what she's doing. You know, she heard of a man of God who can preach with all wisdom uh, concerning the name of the Lord, and she's going to seek that. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You know, he's referring back to Exodus chapter 33, verse 7 there in Hebrews. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, it says, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jesus said, like I said a while ago in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. You know, that's what we do as the bride of Christ. You know, before we got saved, we were seeking God. Uh, you know, I many a times, even after I got saved, you know, would ask hard questions because of a lot of things that I didn't understand that I wanted to understand. And we all have those questions. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, it says that she came to prove him. You know, there's nothing wrong with asking hard questions. If you're sincere in your heart, it says, if ye shall seek him with all your heart. If you're sincere in your heart, you know, a lot of people ask questions and they're only doing it, you know, out of spite or trying to prove you wrong or trying to prove the Bible wrong or something like that. But there's nothing wrong with asking questions with a sincere heart. Many people came to Jesus with questions all throughout the bottle, all throughout the Bible, some sincere and, and some out of, uh, uh, you know, trying to prove him wrong or, or catch him in his words. Uh, you know, try to catch him in, in something that's false that they could accuse him of. In John chapter, three, first, John chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? You know, Nicodemus came to him at night, but he still came to Jesus and asking him questions, asking him hard questions. How can these things be? You know, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. In Luke chapter 18, verse 18, it says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, that's a hard question. You know, what must I do to be saved? Uh, that's a good question to ask. And uh, we should all ask that question. And maybe that's what she was on her way to Solomon to find out. You know, what must I do to be saved? You have all the wisdom concerning the name of the Lord. And John chapter 6, verse 28 says, Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? You know, lots of people came to Jesus with questions. A lot of them were sincere. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? You know, he was thinking he could do some kind of good work to have eternal life. You know, but Jesus knew that he wasn't sincere. So he told him to keep all the commandments, which nobody has ever done. And uh, he went away sorrowful because in the end he told him to sell everything that he had and, uh, you know, come and follow me. But he went away sorrowful. And the best one in Acts chapter 16, verse 30. You know, they not only asked Jesus, but they also asked uh, his followers, his apostles. They asked Paul. It says, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, that was sincere because he fell down on his knees and asked that question. What must I do to be saved? And it said, uh, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. 
And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great story in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. We need to ask questions to find out what the answer is, to find out the truth. Uh, you know, if someone was to tell me while I was unsaved uh, the way to have everlasting life, I would want to know. I'd be asking questions, you know, what must I do? You know, tell me. It's a shame that there's so many false gospels out there in the world today. Uh, you know, works-based salvation. There's only two, uh, if you want to call them religions in the world, and that's free grace or works-based grace. There's only two. You know, there's free grace, which is us. We believe it's a free gift, like it says in Romans chapter 5, six times in four verses. And all the other, all the other religions out there, every single one of them, it's all work-based. So we need to find out the truth. In Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know, by the fear of the Lord, we ask questions. And if we have a sincere heart, he gives us understanding. It says, For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. I mean, who doesn't want that? You know, if she's coming, you know, from a far country to ask uh, Solomon, she's wanting to know how to find out how uh, her years, the life of her years increased. Uh, we should all want to know that. I would want to know that. And Hosea, Hosea, pages are sticking together. Chapter 4, verse 6, it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You know, people are not willing to ask questions. Hey, hey, do I need to do this work to get saved? Or is it free? You know, people don't want to ask questions. They just want to, you know, sit in the pew and just listen to what, you know, some guy tells them and not study it for themselves. He says his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And she's going to Solomon to find out, you know, knowledge. Knowledge concerning the name of the Lord, like it says in verse number 1. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6, it says, To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In Psalm chapter 78, verse 1, it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 2, verse 14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, she came to prove him with hard questions. You know, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Uh, because you have to be sincere in your heart. You have to ask sincere questions. You know, hard questions to find out the truth. God doesn't reveal it unto everybody, but only those who seek Him with a pure heart. And I think that she was doing that because she represents or pictures, you know, the bride of Christ and the people who are who are going to get saved. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 10, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. You know, you have to have a sincere heart. Most people don't. Most people will come and sit in these pews and think, Oh, how great I am, you know, because I'm here in church. Uh, you know, I've got a one-way ticket to heaven. You know, I have to be a good person. I have to do good things. I have to quit sinning and, re you know, repent and all that stuff. You know, be they never understand, you know, the words of God. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I cannot tell you how many people have argued with me over that verse. And many times out soul winning, that's the first verse that I start with. Uh, because they, you know, they always say I have to do good works. It's not of works. You know, but many people will sit in that pew and think, oh, I'm such a good person. I'm righteous because I'm here in church. I'm doing all these good things. I'm going to be in heaven. And my kids are going to be in heaven too, you know, because, uh, because, you know, I'm in church and they're here with me. You know, it's a lot of people believe that, believe it or not. And it's, it's hard to fathom that people actually believe that, but they do. All you have to do is go out soul winning and, and you know, knock on a hundred doors and 90, 90 people that answer the door out of those hundred will say it's, it's by being a good person. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I'm, I, I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. No, it's, it's amazing. We need to ask hard questions and to understand the interpretation of the dark sayings. Because to them it is not given to known, but to us it is given to known because uh, we have a sincere heart and we believe the truth. It says, with a pure heart, seek him. You know, she didn't have a Bible like we have today. You know, they got their in information from the men of God. And the Bible calls them, you know, the kings, the shepherds. That's what all those kings represent. They're supposed to be the man of God. The, uh, the Bible says that all the kings were supposed to write down a copy of this Bible for themselves. So they could uh, judge his people. Tell his people, you know, about God and the true God. Uh, not the fake God that they wanted to believe in, but the true God. You know, but they didn't do it most of the time. But in Judges chapter 17 verse 6 it says... In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, he gave them uh, kings to rule over them, to show them God's word, to give them judgment and justice. Questions are important. That's why we have, you know, our Wednesday night Bible study. A lot of, that's why I always ask if you guys have questions, you know. In most churches it's like that because if people have questions that they're not sure about, that they want to know about, you know, that's the time to ask, and that's a good time to ask. And, you know, I'm not as knowledgeable as, as most pastors. You know, I'm not trying to pretend that I am, but that's what Wednesday night is typically for, uh, for us to ask questions. You know, I've had a lot of, some people sit here in, in the front aisles and try to ask me questions while I'm preaching, and I just have to ignore them. And they think I'm being rude to them or something, but uh, in reality, I just don't want to lose my train of thought. If I get in a conversation with somebody, I completely lose my train of thought. And, uh, you know, if you're rude to them, uh, then they get mad and don't ever come back, which, you know, they don't come back anyways. But, uh, you know, uh, Sunday morning is not the time to ask the pastor questions while he's preaching. That's for Wednesday night. And, you know, that's a good time to do that. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, you know, not all are we supposed to ask questions, but we're supposed to search for ourselves. It says in Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. That means they listened to the preaching. But then it says, and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. The Bible also says this study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, a workman that not a, needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, we're supposed to find out if what they're preaching is true. We ask hard questions, but we're also supposed to ask God. And we ask God by reading his word. And when we ask, you know, people are supposed to give us questions like Solomon did here to the Queen of Sheba. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, we're supposed to be able to edify one another, you know, especially Solomon the, shep uh, Solomon the shepherd, you know, the king of Israel. When people come to him, uh, for questions concerning the name of the Lord, he's supposed to give them an answer. And he, I'm sure he did. And we're going to, you know, find that out as we go through here. But that's enough on verse number one. Let's go down to verse number two. It says, And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, 
with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You know, what that's trying to teach, is, teach us is, you know, what will we give uh, in exchange for our own soul? Are we willing to give up everything that we have, you know, for eternity in heaven? You know, I would be. Uh, the righteous have never been forsaken, neither have I seen his seed begging bread. You know, God will take care of us. You know, these things we have on earth, they're God's anyways. You know, what are we willing to give up, you know, for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? It says that she brought a very great train. There in uh, verse number two, uh, spices and very much gold and precious stones. Uh, you know, she's, she's bringing a great abundance of, of things she's willing to give. Uh, we should be willing to give also uh, for the great gift that he has given us. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, I'd be willing to give everything. If somebody could give me, you know, the wisdom of everlasting life, I'd be willing to give all that I had because, you know, what is this life? You know, maybe 80 years if we're lucky. Uh, maybe more if we're stronger. Uh, what's that compared to eternity? You know, Eternity is everything. You know, our time here is, is, is but a, uh, just a breath that passes away, like it says in the book of James. In verse number 3 and 4, it says, And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, I wanted to stop right there because it says the house that he had built, like I was saying earlier. It's the house that Jesus built. Jesus is the builder. In Psalm 127 verse 1 it says, Find my place, bear with me. I'm sorry, I'm starting in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 10. It says, Behold, a son shall be born unto thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. You know, this is uh, talking about Solomon uh, before he became king. It says that he shall build me a house. But we know that that picture is Jesus. It says, He shall build a house for my name. And he shall be my son and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Solomon didn't reign forever, but Jesus did. So we know this is really about, you know, Jesus. Jesus built the house. And it says that, you know, she's, you know, basically marveling at the house that he had built. You know, she's talking about the house of God. If we continue in verse 11, it says, Now, my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he hath said of thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, and give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Now I want to read Psalm 127, 1. It was on the next page. I couldn't find it because I, I swapped those two verses. It says, A song of degrees for Solomon. 
So this is, you know, David talking to Solomon, his son, a song of degrees for Solomon to let him know what's going on. He says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You know, he's saying, except the Lord build the house. He's telling Solomon to build the house of God. But then he says, you know, except the Lord build the house, they that build it, build it in vain. So he's telling Solomon to build the house of God, but make sure it is of God. You know, make sure it's God's house, a place where people can come from a far country concerning the name of the Lord and learn about him. Jesus is the house builder. But in, in verse number five, it continues there. It says, And the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. You know, she's seen all the great things of God, and it says that there is no more spirit in her. It's talking about how he ascended up into the house of God. You know, it was Jesus that ascended into the Father's house. Uh, when he ascended up into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God, on the right hand of the throne of God, it was Jesus uh, that first descended and then he ascended up into heaven. You know, we can picture this as, as we're reading it there. And the meat of his table, uh, that's the meat of God's table. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. You know, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It says, and the sitting of his servants. You know, how many servants does God have throughout the world? You know, when he talked to Elijah, he says, I have 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. But think about that today, how many servants we have, or how many servants God has in the world. You know, it's in the millions. How many missionaries we have in other countries and other countries over into here? You know, it's, it's flopping in case you guys uh, don't know that. You know, they're sending missionaries to the United States now from other countries where we used to be the only ones who sent out missionaries. But all the servants of God, you know, it, it's amazing her how many servants uh, concerning, you know, the name of God are in the world. And, and, you know, it's amazing how many servants God has in the world today. And it says... And the attendance of his ministers. How many ministers are faithful every Sunday that just keep going and going, even though, you know, they don't get anything for it, they don't, uh, you, you know what I mean. They're just faithful every week because they want to serve God. How many ministers uh, throughout this world, you know, when I was down in Gatlinburg and I, and I went to that church, there was three other people there besides me. And there was a guy there just up reading scripture, you know, because he wasn't a preacher. But he kept the church going because he's a faithful minister unto God. Uh, Jesus said, be thou faithful unto the end and I shall give thee a crown of life. You know, they was just down there being faithful, just like we're being faithful here. Uh, you know, we don't have a full attendance, uh, but we're still here being faithful. How many faithful people are throughout the country that we don't even know about uh, that are faithful ministers of God? You know, praise God for that. And it says, his cupbearers. You know, how many soul winners are out in the world and evangelists uh, and missionaries to other places? You know, that's what a cupbearer is. You know, they're, they're bearing the things of God to other people. Uh, you know, they're, they're bearing the fruit uh, that Jesus has gave us. Uh, you know, it's amazing. You know, we couldn't count how many soul winners there are out in the world today and evangelists and ministers that we never hear of. People that they'll never write a book about. People that will never be on TV or the radio. You know, those are the ones that are faithful cupbearers to God. Uh, they're not going to put those people on TV because they're out there preaching the truth. Uh, you know, they glorified uh, the false prophets back in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, you know, uh, they're going to do the same to us now. Uh, you know, they're glorifying these people they put on uh, TV like John Hagee you was talking about earlier. Uh, you know, I've watched a few of his sermons, and it's crazy some of the things that he says. And, uh, you know, that's just the type of people that they will put on TV. They're not going to put on uh, TV, you know, the people that preach the truth and all the truth, the whole counsel of God. It says, and to his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord. 
There was no more spirit in her. You know, just like when Jesus went up uh, and ascended up on high, you know, there was no more spirit in them. When he uh, came out of the grave, it said that the men were as dead men. Uh, you know, that's uh, the spirit of God. When he comes uh, uh, upon you, there's no more spirit in us. It's his spirit that's in us when we get saved. It says there was no more spirit in her when she uh, saw the descent by which he went up. You know, that pictures Jesus going up into heaven. We have no more spirit. It's his spirit that's in us. The Bible says that he was the first begotten. First begotten of the dead. It was he that ascended up first. It says there was no more spirit in her. In verse number 6, this is where it changes a little bit. It says, And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. She said it was a true report. What she's saying there is, I believe. I believe what you're telling me concerning the name of the Lord. This is where she turns around and believe. You know, she heard of the fame of wisdom Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. But here it says, it, she says it was a true report. That means she believes it was true. In Luke chapter 11 verse 31 it says, For some reason I skipped a bunch of my printed out verses. But anyways, in Luke chapter 11 verse 31 it says, The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. It says that she came uh, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And she shall condemn them because she believed. And what Jesus is saying here is, you don't believe, so you're going to be condemned. She's going to condemn you because she did believe. You're he hearing the same things, even greater things, because a greater than Solomon is here, and you don't believe. She went to Solomon and heard the things of the Lord, and she did believe. It was a true report. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, God, who at Sunday trines and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. It says that he spake in time past because they didn't have a Bible back then. You know, we have a Bible now and we have all the words of God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, we have the whole counsel of God. You know, she had to go to Solomon to hear the words of God, a man, from a man of God. In verse 7 and 8 it says, Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. She said she believed not, you know, until she came and heard the true words of God. You know, just like uh, the woman at the well, she went and told all the men of the city, you know, the things concerning Jesus. Uh, she said, the Christ is here because he told me whatsoever things I've done. And they came back and said, we believe, not because of what you said, but because of what he said. You know, it's the words of God uh, that we need to search for the Bible says that man, you know, can give out the word of God, but it's God that gives the increase. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. You know, what he's saying there is he came to open the eyes of the blind. You know, people who cannot see. You know, just like her, she, she could not see, but Solomon was able to open her eyes through the words of God, the things concerning the name of the Lord. Uh, you know, that's what Jesus does. That's what the word of God does. It opens our eyes. You know, I was blind before I got saved. Uh, just like we all were. Uh, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That's because they're blind. They can't see. They can't see the truth. 
You know, but once you get saved, you know, Jesus opens up uh, your eyes so you're not blind anymore. And that's what she's saying here. I did not believe until I came. It says, I believe not the words until I came. Mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Uh, you know, Jesus came to open the eyes of the blind. Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, it says, And said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do and hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You know, he came to open the eyes of the blind. You know, amen to that. How shall they hear without a preacher, is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10. You know, that's the church. You know, how shall they hear without a preacher? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, she went and heard the word of God. And how should she hear that without a preacher? She had to go and find that out with hard questions. And, uh, you know, he told her everything. She communed with him with all her heart, it says. And then in verse 9, it says, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king, to do judgment and justice. You know, we all know that that picture is Jesus. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which, Sol which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Do we give God all of our praises? When she says spices here, I, I believe that represents our praises to God. Uh, you know, when we praise God, when we come to church and sing hymns unto him, and praise his holy name. You know, do we give him our all when we do that? All of our praises. You know, I think we do here uh, at this church. Uh, you know, we give him all of our praises. And that's what our spices are. You know, the Bible says that, uh, uh, you know, the incense or our prayers up to God. You know, the spices here are our praises unto God. We need to give him all of our praises. Every single one of them. I think we do here. If you would, switch over to verse number 24 and 25. In my Bible, it's on the same page of 1 Kings 10. It says, And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God hath put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold, and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. You know, that's something that we need to do. We need to give, you know, all, give our all to God, you know, year by year. You know, we come to church every single week because we need it, uh, because our world is so wicked today. You know, amen, that we have a place to go every single week. But it says that they came year by year to hear what God had put in his heart. Not just his wisdom, but what God has put in his heart. Go ahead, uh, Flip back over to our last verse, and that's verse 13. It throws in a couple of verses there by Hiram, but that's not part of our sermon today. But in verse 13 it says, And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned away and went to her own country, she and her servants. You know, Jesus has given us everything. Everything in the world is ours right now. And that's what this is saying. He gave her of all his royal bounty. She gave him a bunch of stuff, but it says he gave her of his royal bounty. You know, what does that mean? Jesus has given us his royal bounty. All that is in the world is ours right now, whether we know it or not, or whether we believe it or not, all is yours because it says that. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Therefore let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God's. You know, everything belongs to God. And he gave, gave everything to Jesus. 
And when we're in Jesus, we're part of the family. That means we inherited everything that he has. All of his blessings, everything that he has, which is the whole world, is inherited to us. And you know, one day we're going to share that glory with him in heaven. You know, in the world, we can't just go take stuff that doesn't belong to us. But, you know, everything is ours. Everything that we need, everything that he has belongs to us because we've been adopted into the family. All of his royal bounty uh, is given to us. And then it says, she and her servants. You know, it's another thing here. Uh, like it says in Acts uh, 16, verse 30, what must I do to be saved? Uh, he says, I believe on the Lord. Uh, believe uh, sorry. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean they instantly get saved? It knows. It, it means that you're able to share with them what God has done for you and get them saved. You know, a lot of times, you know, the leader of the house will cause his family to get saved because he believes and he teaches his house. And he, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, it's your house. You know, my kids, I believe, are going to be saved 100% because of what I've done. Because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I teach my kids. Uh, you know, little Robert, he's only seven years old. But, and we think that he doesn't hear anything that I say. But two weeks from now, he'll be asking me questions about the sermon I preached this morning. And it's amazing what their little minds soak up. And if we get saved, odds are, you know, they're going to get saved, uh, you know, if we do things right. You know, my brother... Uh, he was in a Pentecostal church and he was angry all the time. And, you know, he didn't show them a God of love. He showed them a God of hate. And his kids are the furthest thing from salvation right now. If you was to look at them, you'd, you'd think he was in some kind of uh, uh, nightclub somewhere looking at his kids. You know, because he didn't never show them uh, the wisdom of God and the true God, the loving God. He only showed them, you know, the, the Old Testament, what people say, you know, the don't do this and don't do that and uh, God's going to strike you, you know, just evil, wickedness. Nobody's going to get saved. That You have to show them the whole counsel of God. God loved the whole world. Uh, he gave his only begotten son. You know, God is a God of love. All you have to do is read 1 John chapter 4. Uh, you know, that's one of the first chapters uh, Grace Seen read from the Bible. The first verse she ever memorized was uh, 1 John 4.19. We love him because he first loved us. You know, kids, you know, a little five-year-old kid doesn't need to know that uh, uh, they're going to be roasting in hell one day if they don't repent of their sins and throw the TV out the window and stuff like that. They need to know the God of love uh, first. Uh, kind of got off on a rabbit's foot there. But what I was getting at, it says, she and all her servants. You know, did they get saved? I believe they did. That's why it throws it in there. Why does the Bible have to say, and her servants? You know, there's nothing in the Bible for no reason. It says, and her servants. I believe they all got saved too. Uh, just like it says, and thy house. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5, it says, Servants be obedient unto them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free and ye masters do the same things unto them for bearing threatening knowing that your master also is in heaven neither is there respect of persons with him you know he's saying you know masters uh, do unto your servants as you want them to do unto you. Teach them uh, the ways of God. You know, and that's what she probably did. She probably went all the way back rejoicing, just like the Ethiopian eunuch in her salvation, uh, getting every one of those servants saved. And that's why the, I think the Bible uh, says, uh, adds, and her servants, uh, because they all got saved too. And that's what us as Christians need to do. We need to get, you know, everybody we know saved. And we need to go home rejoicing you know, to our own house and get our family saved. Uh, just like the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, I think he went like 7,000 miles through the desert rejoicing, the Bible says. I may be wrong, it may be 1,700 miles. Uh, that's still a long way to go, but the Bible says he went rejoicing. And, uh, you know, he probably heard of God uh, through the Queen of Sheba here. For all we know, uh, a lot of people want to say that... Uh, 
the Queen of Sheba was the Queen of Ethiopia. Uh, that's debatable, I don't know. The Bible doesn't never declare that, but how did that Ethiopian eunuch uh, know to go to Jerusalem to learn about God? You know, it might have been from this passage right here, for all we know.